where we, you can say, also started a little bit was looking at the autocovariance or correlation, but now we call it matrix functions. Not just the autocovariance function, but the matrix function. And this is one of the places where most things are same, same with a small twist. One twist that we have is what you remember from the univariate case. If you looked at gamma of k, how is that relative to gamma of minus k? If the process is stationary, it's equal. It's equal. But it's a little bit different here. So gamma of k as a matrix equals gamma of k or minus k transpose. So you can say for the unitary case again, the same rule applies, but you have to transpose when you go backwards. It will probably make sense when you look at it right now, because what you have, in this case the bivariate case, you have the individual, as we looked at it in R just before, you have the autocovariance with yourself in the diagonal, and then the off diagonal elements, you have the cross covariances. This is one way of looking at it. Another way is to say you have the off diagonal forward up here and backwards down here. And this is where you can see that this here and that there, consider that if it had been multivariate, this would be a matrix that we will have to transpose. You go from there to there. If you want to do the same thing here, you need to transpose it in order for it to be symmetric. So that's the, that's the only thing about this. And this is also, you can say, this is basically the way that R plus this. If you recall, I'm lucky I still have the graph here that you have the correlation, and then you have the positive lags of k and the negative lags of k down here in the left-hand corner. So that's how you get it when you do this. So basically, we can make a plot of the individual autocorrelations, and we can also plot this in a combined plot, as I did in the other plot here, in this plot here, I combine the two off diagonal elements into one. So by combining, you see those two parts there. And what we need to do is, well, the autocorrelation, we need that from like 0 to n. And the cross covariance or correlation, we need that for, for I mean, plus minus somehow. I like the matrix structure because then you have everything in one plot. The only problem is if the dimension of the system is too large, all of a sudden, well, you cannot see anything. I tried to do with a seven-dimensional system. Uh, you need a large screen to make that look nice. Um, okay, so what we did for the ARMA models what to look at what do we expect in theory. Given some coefficients, matrix co matrices phi 1 through phi p, and theta 1 through uh, theta q as matrices, and then a covariance structure. How can we calculate the autocovariance matrix function from this? First, just in words, if you have a pure autoregressive model, then you can write up the dual Walker equations just as you can do for the univary case. You just have the dimension, it's just the dimension of the system times higher. So that you can do. 
if you have a pure moving average model, you have the same thing. You take the multivariate version of what you did in a univariate case. It's just all the same, essentially. The same thing, if you look at it after, in this case, this model, what do you expect when you look at, when you look at these two? What do you expect if you have an AR1 model? How should these coefficients evolve? From univariate case, how should they evolve? Yes? If it was uh, order one? Yes. Then the autocorrelation function, uh, right, it should be exponentially decaying. And it should be exponentially decaying. And similarly, for the multivariate case, you can say it's the exponential decay that you're looking for um, in that. For the moving average model, what would you look at there for the autocovariance? If you have a model of order Q, what would you see? Yes? Exactly. Yeah, not to give, I mean, when you have a true model, you would say they are zero after when you go to orders higher than Q. Exactly. And then zero below Q. And then you're right. If you do it from data, well, you say significant or not significant, hopefully at the same point. If you have a combination, well, you do the same as in the univariate case. The particular formulas are collected in the book on page 255 and, the f and 56, I think it is. Um, so there you can find the particular expressions. As an example here, I will just look at the so-called vector autoregressive model. So we have this model here. We're moving everything by the yt to the right-hand side. What do we do? First, to get the covariance, we, again, there's one more thing that's different here. I took yt and post multiplied by yt transpose. We need to keep track of what do we transpose and what do we not transpose. In order to get a covariance of two vectors, you need to transpose the latter of them to get a matrix as the product. Otherwise, you get a scalar and get the inner product. So the latter should be transposed in this case, which is the case all the way through. Notice when you transpose a product, you f reverse the order of the elements and transpose each element in that product. Now, what is the next thing to do? We write it up because this is the diff assuming it's central, so there's no mean value. We have the autocorrelation or autocovariance of lag zero here, and then we have minus that for lag minus one for multiply on phi one and so forth. And then out here we just have the noise covariance matrix. So that was for one lag. Now, if we do it for like, oh, sorry, just rewriting it a little bit, I can take this. Since I know this is a variance, it means that it's equal to its transpose, right? It's symmetric. So I can say that I can have it on this form, or I can have it where I just transpose all the elements. That should give the same thing. I don't need to write this transpose on the covariance for the noise because it's already a covariance matrix that is symmetric. Now, to get for other lags, what I do is you, you do the same. You just have y t minus k, and then pretty much by that instead of y t. 
And again, you take the system as defined up here, and you then transpose multiply that, and thereby you transpose it. Which also have the benefit that you get, you can say, the, the Ys to be neighbors, so to speak. Here we can do the same thing as we did going from there to there. We just identify what are each of these. So we have gamma of k equals minus gamma of k minus 1, phi 1 transpose, and so forth all the way down. Notice that since we have previous y's, there is no covariance with the current epsilon. Because the relative to the y that we're looking at, it's a future epsilon. So there's no dependence there. So we have this equation. Now, the dual Walker equation is this. Basically, we just do this for different values of k, and we write it up. And then we can find a system of equations that can be solved. If you look closely, you have gamma from gamma zero to gamma k, and you have these coefficients that you know, and then you just solve for that. That's basically, that's one way of doing this. That's basically what happens in software. Now, I don't know if you remember about univariate models. You can write it as a multivariate model. Um, maybe I should just go through it today as well. So if you have any vector also regressive moving average model, you can take that and write it as a just vector also regressive model of order one. The one thing you do is that you increase the dimension of the system, but you can write it as a one. It only depends on the previous state. You just have to invent the right state. So what is the right state? Did I do this? I mean, just, just in a moment. Ah, I'll just go through it. Um, so, what do we have here? First of all, set 1, comma t equals yt. So that's our reference is that our system should end up like this. Now, to do it generically, it's not so nice to do it on a blackboard. So I'll pick a simpler example to do this. So, if we have a model say yt plus phi 1 yt minus 1 plus phi 2 yt minus 2. Let's just do it for an AR model first, an AR2 model. According to the formula up there, what I have to do is to write it Hmm. as set one. By the way, what which order should I have for this system up here? Two, exactly. Because I need the dimension of my AR part here. So I need A two-dimensional system, move it to the right-hand side, minus phi 1, minus phi 2. And then I have to have a row of zeros at the bottom, and then an identity matrix, which in this case is just of dimension 1 here. And then I have it on my state, set 1, set 2, time t minus 1, plus in this case, just the identity matrix and a zero on epsilon t. If you look at this, what happens in here? If z1 is actually yt, 
then set what does set two become? One. So exactly, we have set one. No, no, this set two is not. I mean, you're almost right. No, no, it's it's actually one lag back. So when I have this set one here, it's uh, this one here is y t minus one, effectively, right? And then I then set two is minus phi two times set one or oh, comma t here set at t minus one. That's what we have, which is equals to minus phi two. And this is then y t minus 1. And just to show that everything is as we want it to be, set 1 comma t is equal to minus phi 1, set 1 comma t minus 1, plus 1 times set 2 comma t minus 1 and if we just insert then it's minus phi 1 y t minus 1 plus what we just found up there which is then a minus phi 2 y t minus 1 and then we need to add the noise from out here Thank you. T minus two. It's too good at copying. <laughs> there's no noise in this equation because there's a zero there. That's I need the epsilon there. Thank you. Thank you. So this is how you do it. So for a pure AR model. The set variables here represent the previous lagged states, and it, that kind of expands throughout. If you had a pure moving average model, the set here will contain thetas multiplied on the previous states. When you combine the two, you can say it's a mixture of the two uh, representations that you have, so it doesn't. It's not so nice, but it does work. I don't know if you want me to kind of walk through one just to show it. I won't force you to do this in an assignment, so I just wanted to kind of illustrate that this is doable without being too laborious. Um, maybe if we just add, what if this was a theta over here instead? <laughs> what would happen? is that set 2 of t, what does that, how does that change? I have to add theta epsilon t there, and I have to add theta epsilon t there, right? So what happens down here? Well, I have to say plus this up here, so I just have to say plus theta epsilon t minus 1, because this set 2 here, I now shifted one lag further backwards in time. So it's fairly easy to do it when you're still uh, in small models. And if this was multivariate, it will be just the same. It's one of those places where scalars and matrices are just numbers to some extent. The rest is just abstraction. Maybe just is not the best word to use. So, how do you identify these kinds of models? Basically, it's the same story as for the univariate models. You look at the sample correlation matrix functions, and as 
you answered previously, if you have a pure moving average model, then of order Q, then it should be zero when K is greater than Q. That was nice. And if you do the same with partial correlation matrix function for a pure autoregressive model, then you have the same that when the uh, when k is greater than the order, it should be zero. And then vice versa, you should expect something that is exponential-like. But now you should keep in mind that when you have just a bivariate system like this of first order, you can actually have oscillating values in the autocorrelation function. If you go back one slide here to look at this down here, this was an AR2 model. And from assignment 2, you know that you can have damp oscillations in the autocovariance, autocorrelation for this model structure. Here you have a first order representation of that as a two-dimensional system. So this system should, of course, also be able to show harmonics in the autocorrelation structure in the exact same way. Basically, now, I, if you calculate the determinant of this system where you have the one and the diagonal, you will end up with the same expression as what you solve when you solve up here. And then there's something I won't cover, the so-called sample Q-conditional partial correlation function, where this XQ is K of Q near P comma Q, oh, sorry, um, is also zero when <coughs> the order of P comma Q, when K is greater than P. It's not so useful, useful in practice. Actually, a lot of things becomes a lot more complicated when you have multivariate problems because you have to look at all the correlation structures at once. So we discussed, discussed pre-widening last week. And maybe this is the case where I should again. So how do we do it here? In a univariate case, you fit univariate models to each individual series. That was the same thing as we did as the first step up here for the input series. Then you investigate the residuals from that. That's similar to the second state, uh, step up here. You find the residuals from this here, but where it becomes different is that you should also do the same thing for the y. You should not filter y with the model you find from x. You should, for each state, find its own model. So each individual series. And look at the residual structure. And then you can look at the cross correlation to compare. So this is not the same algorithm than what is up there. Is it me, or is this one lighter than the one over there? Sorry? Yes, that one's lighter. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> That's weird. Oops. So, to swap back. What we have is this. The multivariate model, if we do it such that we do this up here, effectively what we get is that we are looking at models where we have the diagonal, have a diagonal on yt that is containing the de determinant of the original process. And then you have the adjoint of that on the right-hand side. So it becomes a much more complex model as such. And that also means that 
you say the univariate model that we have to fit, because say for the simple case down here, the univariate model for y t also includes the structure in x t as we discussed last week. So we are creating some models that are way too big in many places, and it's quite difficult to kind of reduce that again. So, if you have, again, centered data, and you look at the multivariate models, how do we estimate those? Because we want to estimate mo models. At the end of the day, if we cannot estimate parameters based on data, at least for this course, it's not a useful class of models. So we have this structure. So we have P plus Q matrices that we want to estimate, plus one more thing. We want to estimate sigma, which is the correlation structure for the noise as well. So, in general, there are no analytical solutions. Tough luck. So you need to find some way to estimate this, either by some algorithms or some numerical optimization. Basically, if you have an autoregressive model with potential with exogenous input, just as for the univariate case where we could write it as a general linear model, we can do a least square estimation in that case. When you have the multivariate Armax model, which is the more generic structure, you can also do what maximum likelihood has written down here. Because, I mean, this up here is a subclass of what we have down there. So everything that works for an Armax model also works for an AIX model. Actually, this should be Arimax, because you can also have differencing and stuff like that. But the differencing, you can say, f when estimating parameters, you start by doing the differencing, and then you estimate the, you can say, the stationary model on the difference data. So it really, it, it's just a matter of notation at the end of the day. You have the so-called split method, which we will get back to, but not today. That's actually the topic for next week that is presenting the package is an R package that does this, um, how to make it work, what are the options, because it's same, same, but different from what you're used to in Arima. It has a lot more flexibilities if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, well, flexibilities are pitholes. So you need to know what you're doing to some extent. You can also do maximum likelihood. Unfortunately, since the number of parameters you have to estimate can be quite large, then it may be difficult to make it converge nicely. I don't know how many of you have been doing, you can say, nonlinear optimization of problems where you have many parameters. Many be that 20 plus. How many have done that? Was it smooth and easy? No. Okay, so two out of two said it's not smooth and easy. Actually, three out of three, I agree. Um, so it's not something that is always good. Maximum likelihood also, I don't know if you noticed Arima, what it actually does. It does maximum likelihood, but first it does a least squares optimization. So it does a least square approach first to get close to the maximum likelihood solution. And then when you're close to the optimal solution, then you can run a numeric optimizer. And if you're not too close when you start, but close enough, so then you will end in the right point. But you will at some point experience, I expect in your life, that optimizers are just algorithms. And if you change a little bit parameters, you may not get the same solution. Even though you did not change the model, you just change the tuning parameters in the optimizer. Then sometimes you get something quite different. 
And sometimes you're just looking at it like, what happened? And then you just have to remind yourself. And that, that's why you can say a course like optimization data fitting, it's not, all of these things are, are typically working, but it's nice to know what happens behind the scene so that when things does not work as you expect it to do, that you have an idea of why it could fail. Because this, I believe in this software, it's an optimizer. What doesn't it give me an optimal value? Oh. So in practice, maximum likelihood, I really like it, but it's also difficult. Also, calculation time-wise, the split method is much faster. Um, and said so that some details in the book. I will upload a paper that split, Henrik Split, he is, uh, well, now just retired a year ago uh, as a professor from here. Um, I will upload the original paper, and I will also write, don't expect to read and understand the whole thing, because the, algor the actual algorithm that runs in there, now I cannot quote him directly, unless you, but uh, it's something that you, it's some of those calculations that you do once or twice to make sure you did it right. But then it's not like something you do every day. Then I guess you've all experienced that things are becoming a problem. It's something you did, say, in a course a year ago. If you're looking at the same problem again right now and haven't used it before, I mean, in the meantime, it's not always as easy to solve as it was back then. Have you seen, have you experienced that? <laughs> Good. You're also humans. <laughs> so, today, what we discuss is when you go for, from the univariate setting to a multivariate setting, looking a little bit at closed loops, how do you, how do you identify what is a loop, what is not a, a closed loop, looking at the multivariate Arima structure, here I included the constant mean value as a parameter, but I mean most of the models I left it out be just because it's so much easier to, and in calculations to, leave, to, to show that. I think it's important to say that the stationarity and invertibility, we have pretty much the same argumentation as for the univariate case. You just have to include the determinant of the transfer function uh, matrix here, and likewise for the theta part for the invertibility. And then it's important to remember that the autocovariant matrix function of k is not equal to minus k, but the transpose of that. And I think it's interesting also from a modeling perspective, that no matter which ARMA, ARIMA, whatever model that you have, you can write it as a vector auto model of order one. You just have to increase the state. What does that also mean, which I did not say earlier on? We talked about the Markov property quite a while ago. I don't know if you remember what the Markov property means. Basically, it's a matter of a system is Markovian if it only if the future only depends on the current state and not on the previous state. So if the if your prediction if you have all the information you need to predict the future in the current state, then it's a Markov process. So that this down here actually means that you can take any ARIMA model, like the one we have over here, it's not a Markov process as such, when we write it like this, because it depends on yt minus 2. But if we write it with this notation, well, it only depends on the previous state. The future only depends one leg back. There's nothing, everything that has to be remembered is remembered in this state. So it means that you can take all the uh, Arima models and write them on a form so it's a Markov model. I think that's quite nice, in particular if you're going to, to model 
simulations and do things, it's nice that you only have to keep track of one vector of elements. You don't have to consider time differences in weird ways. You just have to keep track of one at each point in time. And then you can move forward from there. If you're going to do all the predictions yourself, calculating by hand, keeping track of the variance at lag t minus 2, t minus 4, and blah, 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 may become quite tedious. Whereas if you have it like this, it's just a matrix that you multiply on something. And that's easy, because it's just a scaling of the variance, like what we did down here. I know you can say it's a complication to write it like this, but it also has some benefits on the other hand. That was all I wanted to say for now. Then there is a couple of exercises for today, somewhat related to the, you can say, transition from the univariate to the multivariate setting and how to identify things. But I don't know, are there any general questions right now? I know one thing is that the fourth assignment, I think, me, I, I don't remember what I wrote in the calendar, but I it's not going to be available next week. It'll, it'll be at least another week before it's available. So you have a little bit of time to recover after assignment three. <laughs> also to avoid what happened for assignment two, that someone uploaded his report as an answer to assignment three rather than assignment two in peer grading. I was surprised when I looked at it at some point, like someone already handed in assignment three. OK, that's good. <laughs> but that was an error. <laughs> um, so um, I think I'll give you just a, a short break. There's still plenty of time until the end of the semester for you to work on that. So three weeks. Yes. So it's around the 8th of December. It will probably run in a little bit into the exam period, yeah. I mean, if you really want it, the, 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 the other thing is, after the lecture next week, you'll be able to do part of the assignment, but not the whole thing. You'll be able to get started on it. It's been nice for me to have the opportunity to get Yes. I will try to see if I can uh, make it to next week. But you should not be able to exp you should not expect that you can finish it next week. No. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Otherwise, thank you. <laughs>